This is section 4.4, and although computationally this is going to be an easy section, theoretically it might take you a little while to wrap your head around the idea, so be patient with yourself. We're going to talk about uh, coordinate vectors and isomorphisms. So let me introduce this section by giving you a set B of three vectors. Now I claim that sp set spans R2. And so you could see that if you put those three vectors into a matrix, you would have a pivot in every row. There's only two rows. There would be a pivot in every row. So we have spanning, but three vectors in R2 cannot form, cannot be linearly independent, too many vectors, so we don't have a basis. And so what I did was I found a vector W and I wrote it as a linear combination of the vectors in B two different ways. Just trust me on that. You can check it, but but it's true. And the, the point is that that's bad. We don't want that. We would like to just be able to write a vector W as a linear combination of the Vs in one way. Now, if B had been a basis, that would be true. And so that's my claim here. This cannot happen when B is a basis for V. And the way I prove that is by saying, well, suppose you could write X two different ways. Let me get rid of that. Um, suppose you could X, write X two different ways as a linear combination of the basis vectors. Well, subtract these two equations. Then we get zero equals this. I won't read it. You can read it. I claim that that means that all the C's are equal to the D's because C1 minus D1 has to be zero, dot, 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 CN minus DN has to be zero. Why is that? Well, it's because B is a basis. So the vectors are linearly independent. So the only solution to setting a linear combination of the b's equal to zero is all the coefficients are zero. So that brings us to coordinate vectors. If you have a basis for a vector space, you can write any vector x in the vector space as a linear combination of the basis vectors in only one way. We call the coordinate vector the vector of the coefficients. So take all the coefficients out, put them in a vector, that's the coordinate vector of x relative to b. And the notation is um, bracket x with a lower b at the bottom. You can also use parenthesis x with a b at the bottom. But the b is important because the coordinate vector will depend on the basis you use. Now, as a, just a quick example, if I go back above and I take um, the set B of V1, V2, V3 and toss out V3, just have V1 and V2, then that is a basis for R2. So V1, V2, this is a basis for R2. The two vectors are linearly independent. One is not a multiple of the other and they span. So I can write W as <clears throat> V1, minus 4v2, and that's the only way to write w as a linear combination of the v's. And furthermore, the, the coordinate vector of w relative to b, so the notation is w sub b, is, I just pick off the coefficients, 1, negative 4. And that's it. So today we're going to practice going between you know, given a vector x, find xb, and given xb, find x. So here are some examples. Find the coordinate vector of this polynomial relative to the standard basis of p2. So the standard basis is 1t, t squared. That's got three elements. So I know that my coordinate vector is going to be an R3. So it's important to know how many entries you're looking for. So what I do is I write P, P as a linear combination. It's already written actually as a linear combination of the standard basis elements. P is um, two times one plus three times T plus negative one times T squared. So P sub B, is in R3, and I pick the coefficients off, 2, 3, negative 1. 
So that really gives you all the information about the polynomial you need to know. If you know it's a quadratic polynomial and you know the three coefficients, you know everything about that polynomial. There's no reason to have the 1, t, and t squared there. And we'll see that in, in, uh, later in the lecture. So here's another example. Find the coordinate vector of this vector x relative to the standard basis of R2. All right, so the standard basis of R2 has two elements. So xb is going to be in R2. So I need to write x as a linear combination of these two basis vectors, e1 and e2, and that's pretty darn easy. Negative 5, 2 <clears throat> is equal to negative 5 times 1, 0 plus 2 times 0, 1. So xb is equal to just plop off the coefficients, negative 2, negative 5, 2. Oh, well, that's interesting. Note xb is equal to x. It's its own coordinate vector. That will happen every time you use the standard basis of Rn and you want the coordinate vector of a, ve um, of a vector x in Rn. So that one might be confusing because it's so easy. Sometimes that happens. So we'll do some more examples till you get it. Don't worry. Find the coordinate vector of the matrix 1, 2, 3, 4 relative to the standard basis of M2, 2. And the standard basis is the um, 2 by 2 matrices with 1 in each slot and zeros in all the other slots. And they're ordered so that the 1 goes, you know, here, 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 and here. It moves around in order. Okay, so we need to write x as a linear combination of the basis vectors. So that's that's pretty easy. x is equal to, by the way, <clears throat> the, the standard basis of M22 has four vectors in it. So I know that xb is going to be a vector in R4. So that's important to know. So let's write x, let's, let me go back to this, x is equal to uh, 1 times the first matrix, 1, 0, 0, 0, plus 2 times 0, 1, 0, 0, plus 3 times 0, 0, 1, 0, and then 4 times 0, 0, 0, 1. All right, and so the coordinate vector is going to be the vector of coefficients, and there's four of them, as I promised, we're going to be in R4. So x sub b is 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's like a matrix, it's, except you've strung the, the entries out in a line rather than written them in an array. But really, if you know that this is the first entry on the first row, if you know that this is the um, second entry, first row, first entry, second row, <laughs> second entry, second row, if you know where those numbers go, then you could recover the matrix from that, right? You, you know that that corresponds to this matrix here. In general, if X is A, B, C, D, what is the coordinate vector for X? Well, I would just do this computation again, except the 1 would be an A, the 2 would be a B, the 3 would be a C, and the 4 would be a D. And I'd get XB equal to A, B, C, D. So we can almost think of matrices as vectors in R4. And almost, actually we can, and I'll make that more clear when we talk about isomorphisms. Okay, now I'm giving us another basis of M22. You're just going to have to trust me on that. This, these four matrices do form a basis of M22. And um, we're going in the other direction. Now we're given XB and we want to find X. This is actually the easy direction because we're given the weights. So X is 1 times the first vector in our set, 1, 0, 0, 0, plus 2 times the second vector in our basis, and then 3 times the third vector in our basis, and 0 
times the fourth vector in our basis. So we just add those up and that'll give us X. And that's gonna be, let's see, three, and then two minus three is negative one. And then on the bottom, I'm gonna get three and three. All right, let's practice some more of that going between X and XB. There's two directions. I mentioned one was easier and one's harder. Let's, let's practice. Given XB, find X. That's always the easy direction because what you do is you just take the linear combination using the XB as weights and the vectors in your basis um, are your vectors. So in this case, X is gonna be twice the first vector in our basis plus one times the second vector in our basis minus one times the third vector in our basis. So let's see, that's gonna be two plus, that's two and two is four minus one is three and then second entry is going to be two, and last entry is going to be negative one. So that's easy. Okay, the harder direction in general is given x, find xb. Given x, find xb. It's usually easy if you're given the standard basis, but this is not the standard basis of R3, right? This is not the standard basis of R3, so this is a little harder to do just by inspection. Um, in fact, I can't do it by inspection. I had to do a computation. So let me just explain again what we're doing. We're finding the weights in this equation. C1, B1, plus C2, B2, plus C3, B3 equals, we're given X over here, the XB is gonna be the vector C1, C2, C3. So to find those C's, we reduce the augmented matrix. We pop um, the vectors B in as columns and we augment with X. And I, I went through the reduction for us because there's no reason for you to sit here, waste your time watching me reduce a matrix. I think you're all pretty good at it by now. So this is, this is our answer column right here. So C1 is negative two, C2 is zero, and C3 is five. So XB is the vector negative two, zero, five. Now it's always nice going in this direction, you can check your answer. So I wouldn't check it if I was doing homework because my math lab's gonna check it for you. But if it were a quiz or a test, I would, I would take the time to check it if I had the time. So what's the check? is negative two times B1, which is one zero zero, plus zero times B2, plus five times B3, which is one negative one one, is that really equal to X? Three negative five, five. And so let's see, negative two plus five is three, the first entry works, and then I get a negative five and a five, yeah. So. It's nice to be able to check. All right, so why don't you pause the video and you do this one. Just wanna make sure you get it before we move on. You do this one and then when you unpause, I will do it. Okay, so you've unpaused. Let's do the easy direction first. X is equal to twice one three plus 10 times zero one which is 12, 16. Okay, and for the other direction, we wanna solve C1, B1 plus C2, B2 equals X. So I'm gonna reduce the augmented matrix, put B1 in as my first column, put B2 in as my second column, augment with 210. This should not take us very long. One, zero, two, zero. I'm gonna multiply by negative three and add one, four. 
So my C1 is 2 and my C2 is 4. So x sub b is 2, 4. And you can check it. All right, what's special about coordinate vectors is it gives us an isomorphism, which is a one-to-one -one onto map between a vector space and Rn. So the theorem is if you have a basis with n elements in a vector for a vector space, the coordinate mapping that takes a vector to its coordinate vector is a one-to-one -one onto map from the vector space to Rn. So the reason why that's important is that we're pretty familiar working in Rn. However, the vectors in our vector space could be continuous functions, they could be polynomials, they could be matrices. So it might be hard to show, they could be um, equations, sorry, not equations, um, yeah, functions. I'm thinking of differential equations. Uh, it might be hard to show things in the vector space, but it's pretty easy to show things in Rn. And so this mapping allows us to show things in Rn and say, oh, then that's true back in the vector space V. For example, if you have a vector space V and, th and this is your coordinate mapping, x goes to xb. And when we do a mapping, we do it's, a, it's an arrow with a, a straight vertical line in the beginning. Read that as x goes to xb. Um, anything that's true over here, about the coordinate vectors is true over here about the original vectors. So if you can show the coordinate vectors span Rn, then the original vectors had to span V. That's pretty cool. So for example, P2 is isomorphic to R3. And if B is the standard basis of P2, then the mapping would be P equal to a quadratic polynomial, A plus BT plus CT squared, goes to its coordinate vector, PB, which is A, B, C. So if I want to show something's true about polynomials in P2, I could show it's true about their coordinate vectors in R3. And that's what the next example is about. Consider the set of four polynomials in P2. We're going to show certain properties about these polynomials by looking at their coordinate vectors. So first, let's write down their coordinate vectors. I started this out. P1B, when I'm typing, I usually do the brackets, but when I'm writing longhand, I usually do the parentheses. Again, either one, brackets or parentheses. P1b, I pick off the coefficients 1, 1, 0, because there's no quadratic term in that first polynomial. And then the next one is 2, 1, 0. The next vector is going to be t. That's got 0 constant, 1 linear, 0 quadratic. And finally, the last one, 3, 4, 1. OK, now I'm going to place those vectors into a matrix and reduce it to echelon form in order to answer the next two questions about spanning and linear independence. So I already did that. I put the, the four vectors into a matrix, and I'm going to reduce this. I think it's only going to take one operation. 1, 2, 0, 3. I'm going to replace row 2 with negative 1 row 1 plus row 2. So 0, negative 1, 1, 1. And leave row 3 alone. That's echelon. For the questions I want to ask, which are span and linear independence, echelon's good enough because I'm going to look for pivots. So pivot, pivot, pivot. Deter so now we're on to question three. Determine if the P1 through P4 span P2 by determining whether their coordinate vectors span R3. 
So do these vectors span R3? Well, for spanning, you're looking for a pivot in every row. So yes, we have a pivot in every row. So the coordinate vectors span R3, thus the original polynomials span P2. Okay, determine whether the vectors in P2 are linearly independent. So for linear independence of these, of these columns in the, in the matrix up here, we're looking for a pivot in every column because we don't want any free variables in AX equals zero. So no, we don't have a pivot in every column. Not a pivot in every column. So the vectors, the four vectors in R3 are not linearly independent. Thus, the four polynomials in P2 are not linearly independent. So that's interesting. We know that four vectors in R3 cannot be linearly independent, right? It's too many vectors. You, can, you, you can't have, um, the number of vectors can't be larger than the dimension. I can't use that word yet because we don't know what dimension is yet, but the number of entries in each vector. So it turns out that's true for polynomials too. It's impossible for four, vectors, four polynomials to, to be linearly independent in P2. You could at most have three. Okay, so finally, based on number three and four, is that original um, set P1, P2, P3, P4 a basis for P2? And the answer is no, because you would need both three and four to be true. You would need both spanning and linear independence. So that's an interesting example. It was very easy to solve in R4, R3, sorry. It may have been harder in uh, P2. Now, just before I do the true faults, you, have a, you only have one practice problem for home and it won't take long, but you're gonna do one just like I did here, except I'm giving you three polynomials in P2 and you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna write down the coordinate vectors and you're gonna determine Putting by putting, um, you're going to put those coordinate vectors into a matrix and reduce, and you're going to determine whether those coordinate vectors form a basis for R3. Um, and that will tell you whether the original polynomials form a basis for P2. And I believe the answer is yes. Okay, so true, false. You pause this maybe and do it yourself and see how you do. All right, I don't know if you paused or not, but we're back. If X is in V and B is a basis of V with N vectors, X B is in R N. That's true. Because if the basis is B1 through B N, all right, then you would take a vector x and you'd write it as c1 b1 plus dot 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 plus c n b n and then the coordinate vector would be um, in r n because there are n coefficients c1 dot 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 c n that's in r n So, for example, if uh, V were M22, then since that basis has four vectors, the coordinate vector would be an R4. All right, I've beaten that one to death. The next one, R3 is isomorphic to P3. That's false. There are two ways to make it true. R3 is isomorphic to P2. Right, because P2, the standard basis has three vectors, one T and T squared. So that's isomorphic to R3, or you could make it true by leaving the P3 and changing the dimension go R4 is isomorphic to P3. Those are both true state statements. When you go from P to R, you go up one, um, this number, 
this number goes up one to the R. Okay, if B is a standard is the standard basis for Rn and X is in Rn, then the coordinate vector X sub B is X itself. That's actually true, and you might want to think about that for a little while, but I did an example of that on the first page. Example B, page one. Now that was just an example of a single case, but it is true in every case. And then finally, the mapping x b to x is called the coordinate mapping, and that's false because the arrow is going the wrong way. When we take a vector x to its coordinate vector, that's called the coordinate mapping. Okay, a lot of information, not much computation here, short lecture, but but very rich in content. And that's the end.